Hollywood, California, Monday, February 8th. The Lux Radio Theater presents Gene Raymond and Anna Sten in Graustark with James Gleason and Moroni Olsen. Lux presents Hollywood. Another hour brought to you by the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, direct from the stage of the Lux Radio Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. Headlining Gene Raymond, Anna Sten, James Gleason, and Moroni Olsen. Our guest, Rufus Lemaire, Hollywood's foremost star finder. Our producer, Cecil B. DeMille. Our conductor, Louis Silver. Looking over the footlights, I see many Hollywood celebrities in our audience tonight. To them and to our listeners everywhere, a hearty welcome to the Lux Radio Theater. Let me remind you of this, that modern complexion trouble, cosmetic skin, comes gradually. If right now you're letting stale rouge and powder, dust and dirt choke your pores, you're taking chances. Don't do it. Use rouge and powder all you like. But remember that the soap nine out of ten screen stars use, Lux Toilet Soap, removes cosmetics thoroughly. It guards against the tiny blemishes and enlarging pores that mean cosmetic skin. It keeps complexions lovely, the way complexions ought to be. Protection, beauty for your skin at a very moderate cost. And now, our distinguished producer, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, by a strange historical coincidence, we observe two golden anniversaries in the motion picture industry. Fifty years ago, Thomas Edison was completing the experiments that gave the world the motion picture. At the same time, Horace Wilcox was laying out this Cahenga Valley subdivision called Hollywood. Those were days when Hollywood had an entirely different quota of celebrities. Its greatest hero, the subject of countless campfire tales, was still Kit Carson, who as the American chief of scouts helped capture Los Angeles. Its greatest villain was Vasquez, the bandit, who was captured while attending a dance on Sunset Boulevard, where most of Hollywood still dances. To Edison and Wilcox, Hollywood have seemed a mythical and fabulous place, a place that never could exist. Uh... Appropriately, therefore, we dedicate tonight's program to them with the international romance Graustark, in which we hear Jean Raymond and Anna Sten. On the stage at the age of five, on Broadway at 14, Mr. Raymond was a matinee idol before he was old enough to vote. After spectacular su success in Cradle Snatchers and Young Sinners, he turned to Hollywood, where he's not only a leading, leading man, but a successful song songwriter and noted horseman. Tonight, we'll hear him as Glenn Laurie. I first saw Anna Sten in one of the most effective scenes ever filmed. It was in a foreign production with Emil Jannings. Determined to place her under contract, I started negotiations for the service of this very young girl who had starved with her parents in the Ukraine to become one of Europe's most glamorous stars. Then one day, Samuel Goldwyn invited me to his office to ask my opinion of an actress he'd just signed. The actress was Anna Sten. I was greatly disappointed to lose her. But tonight, I have the privilege of presenting her in a DeMille production. She will be heard in the role of Yetif. In the part of Spud Gurvey, we welcome back Hollywood's hardy perennial, James Gleason, whose ability to write comedy is exceeded only by his ability to play it. Moroni Olsen is cast as Baron Obelisk. And here we issue passports to the troubled land of Graustark as the Lux Radio Theater presents the famous George Barr McCutcheon story starring Gene Raymond and Anna Sten with J James Gleason and Moroni Olsen. <laughs> We're on Riverside Drive a wide and oppressive boulevard in New York City, overlooking the Hudson River. In the shadow of Grant's tomb, Glenn Laurie, a young reporter, is sitting on a park bench, 
deeply absorbed in the morning paper. Along the path comes a well-dressed, well-mannered young lady. She pauses for a moment to gaze up at the monument, then turns politely to the reporter. I beg your pardon? I said I beg your pardon. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. Were you talking to me? Yes. Uh, can you tell me what building that is? That? Well, that's Grant's tomb. Oh, uh, uh, Grant's tomb? Yeah, Grant. Ulysses S. You know, he smoked cigar. Ulysses S. Oh, of course. He was president, wasn't he? Hmm? I said he was president of the United States. Hey, what are you doing? Kidding me? Kidding you? I'm afraid I Everybody don't know what... knows Grant, even the kids in school. He was a great man. He must have been to have such a beautiful monument. Um, oh, what did he do exactly? What did he... Look, miss, I'm a busy man. It's 9 o'clock and I'm due at the office at 8.30. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to take up your time. Excuse me. Say, wait a minute. Yes? Are you on the level about this? About what? Not knowing who Grant was? Well, I knew he was president. Hmm. Sit down. Thank you. I don't know whether I'm making a darn fool out of myself or whether you're helping me along. The little girl shouldn't go all through life without knowing about General Grant. <laughs> I know. Yeah. All right, here goes. Full name was Ulysses Simpson Grant, born Point Pleasant, Ohio, 1822. When he was 21, he graduated from West Point, went into the Army. He was best known for his work in the Civil War. Captured Vicksburg, won the Battle of Chattanooga. General Lee surrendered to him at Appomattox, April 1865. Grant was elected president, 1868, re-elected 1872, died in 1885. You seem to be very well informed. Whew, I ought to be. I once wrote an article about him for the Sunday supplement. Oh, you're a journalist. <laughs> you flatter me. I'm a reporter. Well, come on, what's the gag? Gag? Come on, come on. I've taken the bait. Now tell me what it's all about. I don't know what you mean. Ah, I... you know who Grant was. Everyone does. He's one of the idols of American history. But you see, I'm not an American. Oh, no? No, I'm Grouse Tarkin. You're what? Grouse Tarkin. I'm from Grouse Tark. Oh, well, that makes us even. Even? You never heard of Grant, I never heard of Grouse Tark. <laughs> but look, where'd you learn to speak English? My tutor. We never spoke anything but English at home. I mean, the young people, of course. Oh, of course. I'm glad I'm doing so well. This is my first trip to America. Hmm. All alone? Oh, no. I I'm traveling with, with, uh, with my aunt. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Uh, I just happened to be uh, driving by here, and I saw this monument. I wondered what it was, so I got out to investigate. Well, I'm glad you did. Thank you. I uh, didn't know you were a visitor. Say, you ought to have a guide. Oh, no, no, no. I like to find things out for myself. Sure. It's more fun that way. But don't you think that you could learn a lot more and see a lot more if you had someone to show you around? <laughs> someone like uh, you? No, not someone like me. Me. You're very kind. Do you mind telling me your name? <laughs> No. It's uh, Yetiv. Hmm? Uh, Yetiv. Yetiv? Yes. That's a strange name. Y Yetiv what? Uh, Yetiv uh, uh, Guggenschloner. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Guggensch? Yeah. Hmm. That's an even stranger one. Well, it does strike these American ears with a bit of a thud. Do you mind if I call you Yetiv? If you want. Thanks. I'm Glenn Laurie, Morning Star. How do you do? Fine, thanks. Now, uh, what about that kind offer of mine to show you around? Oh, well, I'm afraid I, I couldn't. Oh, don't be bashful. I'd love to do it. But um, my aunt, she wouldn't like it. The point is, would you like it? Yes, but... It's uh, a date. Where are you staying? Uh, the Carlton. The Carlton. But... What about nine tomorrow? No, 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 no. I couldn't. Ten? No. Eleven. Well, I'll see. Good. I'll be there at eleven sharp. It's with age seven. You may come right up Me and... Me too. Uh, oh, It's my aunt. I forgot all about her. Me too. Yes, aunt? I think you should come back in the car now. Yes, Anne. At once, please. Well, goodbye. Goodbye. And thank you very much. Not at all. Uh, say, yeah. uh, uh, so long. So long. To the hotel, Hugo. The hotel, yes, madame. Eighty. Yes. You shouldn't have spoken to that man. Oh, Angie, please. He was a very nice I young man. I do not care. You forget your position. Angie, listen. Is there anything wrong in sitting with a young man talking about General Grant? Who is General Grant? Oh, he's a soldier. President of the United States. He told me all about him. And, um, well, he wants to show me around and tell me about other things. What? He's going to call for me tomorrow morning. You cannot go. Auntie. I say you cannot go. I've never heard of such a thing, a strange Auntie. man. 
You're in America now. We're not back in Graustark. Why can't I go? What can happen to me? Yeti, you're in my charge. I'm responsible for oh, your safety in this country. I know. But all I want is a little freedom. Just a little bit. Please, Auntie, please. Very well, you may go. Oh, Auntie. He can show you all the sights you want. Auntie, you're a dog. But I am going to go with you. Oh, dear. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Laurie. Miss, uh... <clears throat> Miss Guggenschlan is expecting me. Miss, uh... Bugenschlag. It's yes. all right, Hugo. Come in, Mr. Lorry. Ah, good morning. Well, I'm right on time. Yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Lorry, this is, uh, this is my aunt, Gertrude Penelope, Alice, mm-hmm. um, Mrs. Dagmar. Well, how do you do, Mrs. Dagmar? Uh, how do you do? It's very kind of you to invite my niece to see New York, Mr. Lorry. Oh, don't mention it. <laughs> where are you going to take her? I, I beg your pardon? I said, where are you going to take us? Why, uh... Um, my aunt is going too, Mr. Lorry. Oh, yes? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh... <clears throat> I thought the zoo would be nice to start off with, but of course, that's an awful lot of walking for your aunt. I enjoy walking very much. Yes, I thought you... Were... Well, then I figured on seeing the parks and the statues and the Empire State Building and all of that... <laughs> We can let the theaters and the nightclubs go for a while. Theaters and nightclubs? Uh, yes, I've made up a schedule. It's, uh, it's a little strenuous, but uh, I'm sure you'll like it. I yes, certainly hope it won't be too tiring for you, Mrs. Dagmore. You <laughs> need not worry about me. I never get tired. Oh, so that's fine. Well, let's go. <laughs> Check your hat, please. Cigar, cigarette, cigar. Ah, good evening, Mr. Lorry. A table for two, sir? No, three, Joseph. Three? Yes, three. Uh, uh, yes, sir. This way, please. Cigar, cigarette, cigar, cigarette, cigar. Are you comfortable, Mrs. Dagmore? Perfectly. I was wondering if you'd mind very much if Yadid asked. If she wishes to. Thanks. Yadid? Of course. good time? Wonderful. I never knew I could have such a glorious time. Oh, I wish it would never end. Must it end? (laughs) They say all good things do. Look, what are the chances of our slipping out for a while? hmm? Slipping out? Yeah. Away from Auntie. Oh, very bad. Can't you manage it? You know, I hardly ever see you alone. It's been going on like this for a week. I'd like a chance to talk to you. Uh, Let's get out, shall we? But, you know, wait until we go home. Then, uh, when Angie goes to bed, I, um, I'll come down and meet you. That's swell. I'll have the car outside. Well, here we are. Where? Grant's tomb. Don't you recognize it? Oh, yes. It looks different by moonlight. Yeah. Um, Glenn, what time is it? Oh, why worry? It must be awfully late. <laughs> if my Angie wakes up and finds me gone. <laughs> you <gasps> probably raise the roof. So what? Look. Isn't the Hudson pretty? It's beautiful. Yeah. Park and moonlight. <laughs> I guess I picked a pretty good setting. Setting? For what I'm going to say to you. Oh. Native, this is going to sound pretty silly, but I mean it. I've never said it to anyone before, and I don't think I'll ever say it again. It is... No, no. Don't, Glenn. Please. You know? I think so. That's why I don't want you to say it. Why not? Because, uh... Oh, let's not talk about it. But I want to talk about it. I want you to marry me, Yadiv. Oh. I know I haven't got a fortune. I'm not making one yet. But I've got a pretty decent job now, enough for us to live on. And if you marry me, I'll go up by leaps and bounds. I know it. Will you, Yadiv? I can't. But, Yadiv... Don't ask me why. I just can't. That's all. You want time to think. Is that it? No. It won't do any good. It might. I'm satisfied to wait. Glenn, Glenn, I do like you. More than I'm willing to admit. 
even to myself. But then but... what's the trouble? What's holding you back? Oh, I can't answer that. All right, I'm not going to be a pest. But I want you to promise me one thing. Yes? This objection of yours, whatever it is, I want you to promise me you'll think it over carefully. And then if you still think it's impossible, I'll do a fade out. No questions asked. But you've got to promise me. Very well. I'll think it over. Will I see you tomorrow? If you want. All right, let's say five o'clock. That gives you mm, 14 hours to meditate. Long enough? I, I think so. Good. But are we going? Back to the hotel. Say, I don't want you to lose any time. Front there. Front. Say, clerk. Clerk. Yes, Mr. Laurie. Check up on it again, will you please? I have already, sir. Mrs. Dagmore and her niece have left the hotel. Oh, but that's impossible. I had an appointment with her at 5 o'clock. I'm sorry, sir. They checked out about 11.30 this morning. Hmm? I believe their boat sailed at noon. Both? They've gone to Europe? Yes, sir. On the Empress. And she didn't leave any message for me. You're sure? Not a thing, sir. That's funny. I can't understand. If anything comes, I'll let you know. Hmm? Uh, yes, thanks very much. You can reach me at the, at the office of Morning Star. Morning Star, yes, sir. Copy. Hey, boy, copy. Why, oh, thing, it's all I got to say. It's a fire, Hi, bud. Hello, Glenn. What's the matter with you? Oh, I just been in with the boss. I ain't got troubles enough. He's going to send me over to Europe to look at some more. Europe, huh? Yeah, there's a revolution starting up over there in some jake water country I never even heard of. A joint that goes by the name of Graustark. Hmm? Can you imagine that? Wait a minute. Graustark. Did you say Graustark? Yeah, but don't ask a me to spell it. Revolution and I Graustark. couldn't. Holy mackerel. Where's matter? the boss now? He's in his office. Hey, let me get by. Get, get, get out of the way. Where you coming? Speak What's him? the matter with that guy? But I need you for that city hall assignment. Oh, boss, anyone can cover that. But this revolution story is right up my alley. You've got to let me go over there. Well, I don't know, Laurie. McLean's in the Paris office. Oh. He can handle it. I wouldn't be sending you spot if I had a good photographer there now. But listen, boss. Say, why are you so anxious to get the grouse stock anyway? Well, I I like the place. Yeah, how do you know? You've never been there. Well, I I like the pictures of it. Oh, come on, boss. Be a sport, will you? I'll turn you in some of the greatest stuff this sheet has seen in years. Well. Come on, let me go, will you? Well. All right. Swell. Your stuff better be good. Don't worry. It'll be front page. Hiya, Spud. Come in, Spud. What's the layout, boys? <laughs> I'm sending Laurie over, too. Yeah. He'll get the story, and you shoot the picture. Yeah. Sounds like a great setup, Spud. <laughs> What's so great about it? Huh? Why, uh, the revolution excitement. We'll be right over there in the middle of it. Yeah, and miss the Giants opening game. Oh, forget it, will you? Well, I'm going home and get packed. Shake, boss. Thanks a lot. See you later, Spud. Oh, okay. quick, well, what's the matter with that guy? <laughs> he sure is excited. He must be nuts. You'd think he was going to meet his girl. Can I see your ticket, please? Ticket. Oh, ticket, please. 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 Ticket, Put Goyby on this end. I said Goyby, not Scoyby. <laughs> Who's this? What? Look, I don't understand you. I says I don't understand you. Look, look, no speak of the grouse, Doc. I only been here a week. Talk American, will you? Now, what do you want? Yeah, this is Mr. Lowry's room. Who? Oh, yeah? Okay. I said, okay. We'll be there. Who's that, Spud? Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks a lot, Major. Well, my friend, where you been? American Embassy. Any luck? No. Nope. He went all through the records. Said he never heard of a girl over here named Guggenslana. With a name like that, he should ought to be glad of it. Ah, oh, shut up. Who was that on the phone? Baron Albert's secretary. It's all fixed. What's fixed? The interview. 
You're going to meet the Baron personally. He's the big meat course around here, you know. Head of the cabinet, head of the army. He'll give you the whole lowdown on this tin sword revolution that ain't taking place. Now, yeah, where do I meet him? At the palace, my pal, at Four Bells. All right, order me a car, will you? Oh, it ain't allowed. Huh? It's horses over here, Frank. They never heard of an automobile yet. If they have, they're not in favor of it. Oh, well, get me a carriage. Sure. And a horse. Sure. What? Hey. Hello? All right, say, I want a carriage. Can you get me one? A carriage. Look, a couple of horses and a buggy. No, no, no. Horses. Ho- you know, they gallop. You will wait in here, please. The Baron's secretary will come presently. Thanks. Oh, Baron, if you have a moment, I... Glenn. Jaded. What are you doing here? Well, I could ask you the same thing. I've been looking all over for you. Oh, Glenn. You left New York in a hurry, didn't you? Yes, I... We had a cable. You might have let me know. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it would be easier that way. Just to walk out? Sure, that's always easy for the one who does the walking. You know, you never did answer my question. You came here? All the way here? For that? I was sent by the paper. Oh. Well, did you think it over? Yes. That's why I didn't let you know. I didn't want to hurt you. Oh, I see. The answer was no. Well, I said I wouldn't ask any questions. I won't. Oh, Glenn, I wanted to see you that day. If I'd just been able to say no, simply, it wouldn't have been so bad. But but I would have had to tell you something else. What? I, I'm going to be married. Oh, so that's it. I'm sorry, Glenn. Terribly sorry. Uh, what is it, Hans? The Baron has an appointment here with the newspaper reporter, your... Yeah, yeah, yes, Hans. Um, this is the gentleman, Mr. Lorry. The Baron Alberley's secretary, Mr. Lorry. Who, him? <clears throat> well, I thought you were the secretary. No. Tell the Baron Mr. Lorry is waiting, Hans. He knows already, your highness. Highness? You? Yes, Glenn. I am the Princess Yetu, ruler of Graustark. <laughs> In just a moment, we are going on with the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Graustark, starring Anna Sten and Gene Raymond with James Gleason. Meanwhile, let's go over to the corner of Broadway and 42nd Street on the RKO Radio lot. Practically every afternoon, you can see stars and extras bicycling there after work is done. It's hard exercise, too. Listen to what these extras say. Phew, I'm hot. Pedaling around in this weather is too much for me. How about sitting down a spell? We could sit on the commissary steps if you're not too proud. Like to, but I can't. Have to go to Pasadena tonight. Dinner with friends. You'll never make it. Me, I couldn't move a step. Oh, I'll make it all right. Dead as a dog now. But life will look better after my bath. A few moments in a warm tub while that nice, fragrant nut toilet so blather does its work will feel like a million. Now the sequel to the story. If you could follow Linda tonight, you'd see her refreshed, full of pep, confident, as girls are when they are sure of daintiness. Linda knows she can depend on Lux Toilet Soap's rich, active lather to remove perspiration, every trace of dust and dirt. She knows it leaves skin sweet, delicately perfumed, attractive. Why don't you try a Lux Toilet Soap beauty bath? Once again, Mr. DeMille. We continue the story of Graustark, starring Jean Raymond and Anna Sten, with James Gleason and Moroni Olsen. <laughs> One week has passed since Larry discovered Yetif is the princess of Graustark. We're in the princess council chamber where the Baron Alberlitz and her aunt are scolding her. They resent the courtesy she has shown to the young American. Your Highness, if I may say so, your conduct with this young American is most unbecoming to the princess of our realm. Perhaps you will explain what you mean by that, Baron Alberlitz? There's no explanation necessary. He's been coming here to the palace every day. At my invitation. Exactly, and that's what I find so deplorable. Your Highness, you do not realize the seriousness of our situation. An armed force is rising. At any moment, General Dannox may strike. And were it known that more than half of our guards are at the border, 
They would strike tonight. And uh, what would he have me do? Arm myself with a musket? It is. We can do without that. Your Highness, our country is in desperate need of money. The powers refuse to advance us another penny. Our only salvation is an alliance with Prince Lawrence of Axfiain. An alliance by marriage. I have already told you, Baron Albalis. I'm willing to marry Prince Lawrence, as much as I despise him, if it will save Graustark. But you refuse to see the prince. He's called repeatedly at the palace, and always you've made the same excuse. I saw him twice. That was enough. If I have to look at him for the rest of my life, I think I might be spared it now. Well, you have no objection to looking at the young American. Not this slightest. Oh, how strange. A commoner takes the prince's fancy. I reserve the right to choose my friend. Well, do you realize that this friendship may result in our defeat? I don't see how. Prince Lorenz is not the man to play second fiddle to anyone. Least of all a common newspaper man. If the prince withdraws his offer of marriage, and with it his financial support, our government falls like a rotten branch. Danux and his troops will sweep the country. And all because we have a ruler who refuses to be loyal. Baron Alberly, I don't like your tone. And I don't like your actions. Be quiet. This friendship must come to an end. I demand it. You demand it. You. Baron Alberly, you are minister of state, a loyal and trusted servant. But may I remind you that you are a servant... I'm the ruler here, not you. I beg your highness pardon. You will excuse me now? Gladly. Thank you. And don't return until you learn a little more respect. Very well, your highness. Hans. Yes, your excellency. Come here quickly. Yes, Your Excellency. Did we receive any word from General Danitz? No, Your Excellency. He's waiting to hear from you. And he will. Send him a message at once. Yes. Tell him that only half the guards are at the palace. And he may strike when he is ready. So soon, Your Excellency? Why not? But the people, his troops, they won't fight until they hear that the princess is to be married to Lawrence. You may tell him the date for the wedding has been settled. It has? You may tell him that it has. Oh, yes, Your Excellency. And one thing more. The American newspaper man. I want him followed day and night. Someone must watch him at all times. Yes, Your Excellency. And if he speaks to the princess, I want a complete record of everything that is said. But uh, may I ask why, Your Excellency? Well, he stands in the way of her marriage with Prince Lorenz. If she should decide not to marry the prince, there would be no uprising. Well, that wouldn't fit in with our plans. You understand? Of course. Now, I'm not certain what steps we shall take, but he must be put out of the way. Now, that's why I want him followed. Every minute. Yes, Your Excellency. Now, send that message to General Danux and tell him to stir the people up about this marriage. The house of Graustark must fall. But, Excellency, if it does fall, if the people attack the palace and win, they'll demand a parliament. And they'll have a parliament, Hans. A very good one. General Danux... And myself. Your Highness. Yes? Mr. Glenn Laurie is in the anteroom, Your Highness. Oh, all right. Send him in. Very good, Your Highness. Mr. Laurie. Thank you. Hello. Glenn, I asked you not to come again. Yes, I know. And why did you do it? Oh, just curiosity. I've given up not asking why. I told you why. It's causing trouble. I'm going to be married. When? I haven't decided. Good. Then there's still time. Time for what? To chuck the whole business and come to your senses. You can't marry this Lorenz fellow. I saw him yesterday around the hotel. Why, he looks like an overstuffed tailor's dummy. No, Yadiv, you can't do it. I'm not thinking of myself. I know. You're thinking of Graustark. They fed you with a lot of talk about what'll happen if you don't marry him. Well, what will happen? The country will go broke, and in a year or a couple of years, there'll be an uprising. If you do marry him, there'll be an uprising anyhow, only sooner. You seem very sure of yourself. Well, I've studied the situation, Yadiv. It's part of my job. The people want a parliament. You can't blame them for that. If you marry Lorenz, they're afraid they won't get it. They were promised I think perhaps part. my ministers know what's best for the people. All right. It's none of my business anyhow. Oh, I'm sorry, Glenn. Let's not talk about it, please. We have so little time left. You mean they're going to announce the marriage ceremony? Soon, I imagine. And there is always the danger of an attack by Danik. He'd storm the palace tonight if he knew how the guards were at the frontier. Hmm? Who sent them there? Oh, I don't know. 
I try to keep track of everything and everybody, but I can't. <laughs> you make a very bad princess, Yeager. <laughs> I know. Why did you have to be one? Why couldn't you have just been plain Yadav Guggenschlag? <laughs> you know that name? Well, it has its compensation. You see, Yadav Guggenschlager wouldn't have had to catch the next boat back to Graustock. She'd still be in New York, seeing things, going places. And having the grandest time of her life. No worries. No headaches. No revolution. No problems of state. And no Prince Lorenz. Boy. She wouldn't have to get married unless she wanted to. A very fortunate girl. And I think she might have wanted to. Don't you? Perhaps. It's not too late. Please. You don't realize. Yeah, yeah, I know. I've got a lot of nerve proposing to a princess. Well, what of it? Before you were a princess, you were a human being. Well, I'm human too, and I'm asking you to... You're asking me what? I'm asking you to chuck this, Yadiv, all of it, and get out while you still got time. What? You don't want to be a princess. You said so yourself. Then why don't you give the people a break, hmm? Let them run things the way they want. They'll be happier, and so will you. You, you want me to abdicate? Is that it? Right. And uh, what do you offer in exchange? You really want to know? Yes. <laughs> all right. I'm offering you a three-room apartment in New York and half my salary every Saturday night. I'm offering you a two-by-four kitchenette where you'll have to learn how to cook and turn around without burning your elbow. I'm offering you a little bunch of flowers every payday and the movies once a week or a walk in the park when we can't afford that. In short, I'm offering you a lot of work and a lot of grief and a lot of fun, if you'll see it that way. Oh, Glenn. Well, what's the answer? Oh, Glenn, I do love you. And I'd love that place. <laughs> I know I would. <sighs> but I can't, Glenn. Oh, why not? Because, because as still as it sounds, my people need me. Oh, yet if they don't, they don't need anyone but themselves. My people love me. That's true, but they despise your ministers of state. The best possible thing that could happen to your people be for you to clear out and let them run things for themselves. No. Oh, yet if you're way behind the times, look around you. It's a new world now. A world that has no need for kings and queens and princesses. You're outmoded, old-fashioned. You're through and you don't know it. Stop it. But the people know it. Listen, there's a revolution starting out there behind those walls. A revolution that'll sweep you and your ministers clean out of the country. I'm asking you to abdicate now before it's too late. You've said enough. You'll leave now, please. Yet if... Please. I... All right. All right, Yet if... Your Excellency. Yes, Hans? I have here the transcript of the meeting between the princess and the Americans. Oh, yes, yes. Let me see. It is word for word, Your Excellency. Our man took it down over the dictograph. Hmm, very interesting. But I'll look it over later. Tell me, have you communicated with General Danix? Yes, Your Excellency. His troops will begin the attack on the palace at 11 o'clock. Good. Keep under cover, Hans. Go to the west wing when the firing begins. I've told Danix that he must not shell that section. Very good, Your Excellency. Thank you. So I said, listen, Pachesi, if you think I'm going to spend three bucks for a buggy ride alone... Oh, lay off, will you, Spud? I'm trying to read. Yeah, I noticed that. Oh, what? So do you always read upside down? Huh? <laughs> uh, What's the matter, thinking about her nibs? Her nibs? You know, the princess. Oh. See you today? Mm. What you have to say? Mm. Did you date her up? Spud, for the love of my... Okay, my pal, okay. Hey, Spud. I got an idea that some of the people at Yadav Trust are in back of this plot. Now, take that fellow Albert. Why would he send Harry Hey, did you ever out? stop to think that maybe Yadav's selling Graustark short? Spud, sometimes you're so dumb... Okay, I could... my pal, don't I... get sore. I just thought I'd ask. Mm. Oh, what time is it? Almost 11. You better go to bed. Yeah, that's about all you can do in this break. I came over here to take pictures of a revolution. So far, all I got is the outside of the palace and a lot of horses. I ain't seen so many horses since Ben Hur. If they're going to start something, I wish they'd start soon. I'm getting tired of this. Yeah, and so is the boss. Hmm? What do you mean? A cable come for you today. Listen. When does Danik start revolution? Waiting for details. Get story at once. Oh, what does he think they do? Start revolutions just in time to make the first edition? I'll answer that. I did already. Huh? What did you say? Need 500 bucks additional expense money. Weather very warm. <laughs> What's that? 
sounded like thunder. Not to me, it didn't. I swear it was a gun. Yeah. You hear it? I tell you, it's thunder. Yeah. Nothing could happen in a display game at 10 p.m. I'll take it. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. What? Are you sure? What is it? Wait a minute. Go on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. But will you tell me what's going on? Yeah, wait a minute. Okay, mister. Well, thanks for the tip. What's going on? It's the revolution. It's happened at last. Who's that on the phone? The manager of the hotel. All foreigners are ordered to keep in the rooms. No one will allow out on the street. Well, get your hat, Spud. We well, got work to do. Say, hey, wait a minute. Where's the fighting? It's at the palace. They're shelling the, the palace. palace. I'll see you later. Hey, wait, you can't get there. Well, get there. Hey, listen, Spud, you I'll get some pictures and dig up a story. Wait a minute. I've got to find you. Again. What's the matter with that guy? Show me the east gate. I entreat you to leave the palace while there's still time. I'll stay here, Captain Bullard. But your highness... How many men have you? Less than 300. We can't hold out much longer. Where is Baron Alberlis? Why doesn't he come here? I've looked for him, your highness. He's nowhere to be found. You must find him. And you've got to hold the gates. You've got to. Yes, your highness. Captain Bullard. Your highness? Captain Bullard, I... I can trust you, Captain. With your life, your highness. Then remember, it is my life. I'm staying here with my men. Tell them that. Yes, Your Highness. Judith! Ben! Oh, are you all right? How did you get in here? Never mind that. The question is how you're going to get out. I'm not getting out. Oh, don't be a fool, yet. If I've just come through that mob out there, they've got blood in their eyes. Now, listen. I can get a carriage to the West Gate. I'm not I... leaving. My men are out there giving their lives for me. Sure. Those that aren't hiding in the cellar. My soldiers are loyal. Yeah, yeah. How do you suppose I got through the gate? By slipping one of your loyal soldiers 50 bucks. What? Yeah, now, come on. Your Highness. Oh, Baron Alberley. Come here. Your Highness, I have just been informed of Herr Lari's arrival. He bribed his way through the gate. Indeed. Do you understand? He bribed his way through. What's happening out there? Are my own men turning against me? Well, there is no need to excite yourself, Your Highness. Herr Lari was allowed to pass through the gates at my specific order. What? what? And it is now my pleasure to place Herr Lari under immediate arrest. What are you talking about? Arrest? What for? Well, if he were a citizen of Graustark, Your Highness, I would call it treason. Treason? What? The betrayal of military secrets to the enemy. Are you crazy? It's very simple, Your Highness. In your conversation with Herr Lari this afternoon, you disclosed the fact that we have only half the guards at the palace. No one knew of this but you and me and Herr Lari. I accuse him of informing General Danux as to the state of our defense thereby provoking the present attack. Listen, you, another crack like that now... Lieutenant, uh, Your Excellency. Place this man under arrest. Uh, you can find him to the North Tower. One moment. Baron Alberley, may I ask how he knew of our conversation? Well, it is of no significance, Your Highness. This man pleaded with you to abdicate in order that you might be free to marry him. You refused, and he took the only possible course open to him. He betrayed Your Highness to the enemy in an attempt to bring about a quick overthrow of Your Highness' royal position. Say, did you ever try writing stories? You've got a swell imagination. Man, this isn't true. Oh, what it do you... It can't be true. What do you think? Oh, I, I don't know. You did ask me to abdicate you. His exact oh. words, Your Highness, were these. The best possible thing that could happen to your people would be for you to clear out and let them run things for themselves. You're through and you don't know it, but your people know it and I know it. Glenn, you did say that. Sure, what of it? It's the truth and you know it. Be quiet. If you were out of here, I wouldn't care if they, if they shell this palace to pieces. Well, be quiet, I say. And they'll do it, too. They'll set up their own government with their own laws and their own leaders and it'll be a darn good thing. There it is. Now, do what you want about it. You see, Your Highness. Take him away. You really mean it? You have forgotten once too often that I am Princess of Graustark. Yeah. I just can't help thinking your name is Guggenschlaner. Lieutenant. Yes, Your Excellency. Come along. Take your hands off. I don't mind spending a night in a cell, but I won't be pushed into it. It will be more than a night, Herr Lari. Oh, yeah? Not when the American ambassador hears about it. Think you got trouble now? Wait until tomorrow. <laughs> well, pleasant dreams, Your Highness. <laughs> For 
station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KNX Los Angeles, the voice of Hollywood. We will continue with the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Graustock, starring Anna Stan and Jean Raymond, with James Gleason shortly. No modern Galileo glued to his telescope is more persistent in his endless search for new stars than the talent scouts of motion pictures. In this field of face finding, none has a more glowing record than Rufus Lemaire. Since coming to Hollywood, he has brought over 200 new personalities to the screen for Warner Brothers, MGM, and Universal Studios. His more famous discoveries include Louise Reiner, Eleanor Powell, Betty Davis, George Brent, Dick Powell, and Gertrude Neeson. Today, he is executive assistant to Charles Rogers, production head of Universal Studios. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Rufus Lemaire. Thanks, Mr. DeMille. Since there aren't any rules for turning up talent, Mr. Lemaire, how have you found your star-spangled array of discoveries? Chiefly through luck, I suppose. For example, three years ago, I was given a tip to look up an actress playing in a tiny theater in Vienna. I couldn't understand a word she said, but her personality spelled box office, and I brought her to Hollywood. Her name is Louise Reiner. Eleanor Powell, another MGM star, was dancing in a low-state theater in Times Square when a wire came from Hollywood to the MGM office located in the same building was in order from Lewis B. Mayer to find a dancer at once who could rank with Fred Astaire. I saw dozens but never thought of Eleanor until I happened to glance at her name on the marquee as I was returning to the office. That is the only instance when I found a star literally on my own doorstep. Hmm. I wish Betty Davis had wandered to my doorstep. Uh, Betty was already in pictures before she was really discovered. <clears throat> Another studio had cast her in gingham dress types and no one paid any attention to her. I suggested we give Betty a little sophistication. It was a lucky guess, but Betty skyrocketed to fame overnight. Gertrude Neese and I had seen in New York several times without being impressed. But when she sang at the Trocadero here in Hollywood, with a new style of song, a slimmer figure, and a new style of hairdress, I couldn't hand her a contract quickly enough. And Deanna Durbin is a universal star, only because another studio let her go, and I was fortunate enough to catch her on the rebound. Everyone always asks, what are the qualities that make a star? Well, there are three. A voice that you believe when you hear it saying, I love you. Second, charm. And third, appearance. A good complexion, for instance, is not only something nice to look at, but it is a definite reflection of character. No one knows this better than a star, and I've seen enough luck soap in Hollywood to realize it is by far the favorite of those who must always look their best. Is there any reason why one section of the country should produce more stars than another? No, they'll come from everywhere. <clears throat> Though a great many of our future stars are right here in Hollywood, hoping to get a screen test. They haven't had experience, and you can't blame producers for hesitating to experiment with them. It's a big chance to take. But we at Universal took it when we starred Deanna Durbin, Barbara Reed, and Nan Gray and three smart girls. And we're going to take it again to the tune of a million dollars in producing Top of the Town, with a cast composed entirely of new faces, headed by Doris Nolan, George Murphy, Gertrude Neeson, and Ella Logan. I'm confident that when you see this film, you'll not only be seeing a fine show, but you'll get your first glimpse of at least four stars of the future. Good night. Good night, Stargazer. We return to our story, Graustark, starring Gene Raymond and Anna Sten with James Leeson. <laughs> It's the following morning. In his cell in the North Tower, Glenn Larry walks the floor impatiently. Suddenly, he hears a footstep in the corridor. The door is unlocked, and Spud enters. Spud. Hiya, pal. Okay, Jelly, come back to me in ten minutes. Yeah. Well, what's the news, Spud? Plenty. They've declared a temporary truce. They're going to stop and talk things over. Hey, I got some swell pitches last night. No, I mean, what's the news about me? When am I going to get out of here? Oh. Pretty soon, I guess. Pretty soon? What do you mean, pretty soon? Uh, it's a nice little place you got here. How's the bed? Comfortable? What do you mean, pretty soon? You know, you certainly managed to get yourself tied up in some awful knots. How do you do it, anyway? Oh, for the love of Mike. It's like a story, you know? Boy meets girl at Grant's tomb. Boy follows girl to Graustock. Boy proposes to girl. Girl throws boy in a can. It's like a story. <laughs> 
but if you don't shut up, I'll strangle you with my bare hands. I want to know when I'm getting out of this place. I'm, I'm coming to that, my Pam. Um... Say, you know, you should not have been with me last night. No, where I was? Right in the middle of the revolution. And did I get some pictures? Oh, boy. I'm standing right in the middle of the mob, see? I got my camera under my coat, and who marches up at General Danix? Right smack in front of me with about ten assistants. Boy, I never see so much gold braid in my whole life. So what happened? Spot. You know what I did? Well, will you answer my question? When do I get out you, of here? Give me a chance, my pal, will you? So I snapped the picture. Danix and his parents. The only ten they ever been snapped. Spot, I'm going to poke it? that nose of yours. Okay, get... okay, okay. What's on your mind, my pal? <laughs> What's on my mind? Did you go to the American embassy? Certainly I went to the American embassy. Good. What did the ambassador say? Well, uh, nothing. What do you mean, nothing? He left town on business day before yesterday. He won't be back for a week. What? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And what happens to me in the meantime? Well, I guess you're stuck. Uh -huh. Now, about the pictures. Shut up about you know... your pictures. I don't care if you snap Danik standing on his head. I want to get out of here. Right here. Yes, sir, I think. Good morning, Herr Lorry. Oh, it's you. What do you want? Well, I've come to pay you a little visit and to have a short talk. Well, the shorter it is, the better I like it. You'll change your tone, please. Remember, you were my prisoner, Herr Lorry. Who's this guy, Glenn, the Royal Stooge? You're excused. Get out. Hey, you know, I've seen you before someplace, Colonel. I said get out. Okay, okay. But don't shake your medals at me, Major. I'm the American press. Well, be seeing you, Glenn. Yeah. So long, pal. So long, Corporal. Hey, I could swear I seen your kisser before someplace. Are you using you to live in Brooklyn? Get out! <laughs> well? Sit down, Herr Lottie. What do you want? Herr Lottie, I regret the necessity of confining you here. In fact, it is my sincere wish that you remain with us for as short a time as possible. Mm -hmm. Go on. Well, I'm prepared to release you at once and on one condition that you cross the border by 6 o'clock this evening and make no attempt to return. Mm, suppose I don't agree. Well, then you must stay with us. Indefinitely. At least until the revolution is over. All right. I'll stay. I see. You are making a mistake, Herr Lottie. Mm, maybe, but I'm staying just the same. <laughs> Fighting starts again, Your Highness. They're not attacking the palace, Captain. No, Your Highness, but they are moving this way. The Americans. Captain, is he safe? For the present, Your Highness. If they attack the I, North Wing... I would like to speak to him, Captain. You will bring him to me here. But, Your Highness... You have my orders, Captain Boloris. I will see him here at once. I love... You will go in, please. Thank you. Glenn. Hello. I hear you want to see me. Yes. How have you been? Did you have a good night's rest? Please, Glenn. I did, too. Pillow is a little hard, though. And I suggest you widen out those cells. The ventilation is awful. Glenn, I am sorry. Really? Yes? I... I didn't want to put you there. Yes, I know. It hurt you worse than it hurt me. That's what my father used to say. I had to do it. Oh, Billy. I couldn't trust him. He might have done anything. At least he was safe in there. Oh. You do understand. Well, I didn't quite see it that way last night. What happens now? I'm giving you an escort to the border. You will leave in a few minutes. And what about you? I'm staying here, of course. Yes, of course. Well, Albert's made me the same offer a little while ago, and I told him I wouldn't leave. But why? Because I wanted to see you again. You see, I still have an idea that maybe this is all a bad dream. Maybe we'll wake up soon and discover that Graustark never even existed. Maybe this palace is a myth and it has no princess. It's not a dream, Glenn. Oh, I wish it were. You asked me if I slept well. Shall I tell you what I did? I was awake all night, facing my room, trying to find in my heart some justification for leaving my country. Yes. I did not find it, Glenn. My duty is here. I've got to stay. Well? It, uh, it's their skirt that come for you. Shall we say goodbye now? Yes, Glenn. Goodbye, Edith. Goodbye, dear. And think of me sometimes. I'll be thinking of you. Come in, please. The escort is ready, Your Highness. Yes, Captain. Well, come on. Stand back. Your Excellency. Good morning, Your Highness. Baron Arborist? Ah, our friend, Herr Lottie. You've decided to accept my offer. 
It's Her Highness's offer I'm accepting and not yours. Splendid. I wish you Godspeed, Herr Lally. I won't say what I wish you. Come on, get out of there. You cannot go in there. What is that? Listen, I'm the American press. See, I go in each place. Oh, you can't go in there. Hey, hey, Spud. Hello, Spud. (laughs) Hey, Glenn, I got a story for you. What do you mean by forcing your way in here? Well, if it ain't the lieutenant, you're just the man I wanted to see. Put this man out. No, you don't. You handle me with care, Corporal, or I'll spill my story all over the country. Hmm? What story? A pet. Baron Arbolitz turns traitor. Sells out to the enemy. What? Arbolitz conspires with General Danix to bring about downfall of House of Graustark. Arbolitz is first class heel. You, you dare. What does this mean? Just what I say, lady. Glenn, remember those pictures I took of Danix yeah. and his officers? Yeah, what about them? Well, I took a good look at them again. And who's standing right beside Danix but our pal, Corporal Arbolitz? That's a lie. Oh, have you got the picture with you, Spud? Sure, here, take a slant. Good see? work, Spud. There it is. Look at him, Yadav, the one on the end, see? Right. right. This is ridiculous. So you're the one who slipped Danix the information about the guards, huh? And you pinned it on me. Your Highness, this man is insane. Oh, no, pictures don't lie, even for you. Captain Dolores, arrest the Baron Arbolitz. Uh, <laughs> no, no, you can't do this. Yeah, that's what I said last night, Baron, but I landed in the jug just the same. Take him away. Yeah, and do me a favor, will you? Stick him in the North Tower. Bud Mott. <laughs> Look at him now. He ain't even a buck private. Oh, you'll regret this. Janet will sweep the country. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the man I've been listening to all these years. The man who spoke to me of loyalty. Now, Yeda, you wanted justification. Wait. Captain Ballores. Uh, Captain Ballores, uh, what um, what would happen if I um, abdicated? Your Highness, your people love you, but they love freedom even more. You you mean uh, uh, they'd get along without me? I I'm not needed here. They can run things themselves. Yes, your Highness. Oh, oh! Then stop the revolution. Tell them I'm abdicating. Your Highness. Oh, thanks. Oh, no, my thanks. Oh, and my thanks. Spud, get those steamer tickets, quick. Two, three, get it? Got it. But I gotta grab one more picture before we leave. What picture? My friend of Baron, sitting in the North Tower, checking off the days on the calendar. <laughs> <laughs> See you later, folks. <laughs> well, Yadiv, what are you thinking of? Uh, it's all so strange, Glenn. It's a little hard to get used to at first. To think you're not needed. Why, I need you, darling. And I'll be a very willing subject. You? (laughs) You'll be harder to go on than the whole kingdom. So we sail away from Graustark and drop anchor again in Hollywood. By the way, when Hollywood was founded 50 years ago, the majority of its citizens were sheep. When it became a town, one of the first laws prohibited the driving of more than 2,000 of its fleecy residents down Hollywood Boulevard at one time. The sheep have long since gone the way of all mutton. And Hollywood is now part of Los Angeles. But as a dog's paradise... It still has a large four-footed population. Since both our stars are owners of celebrated dogs, perhaps they'll tell us something about them. Ladies and gentlemen, Jean Raymond and Anna Sten. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. The only claim to fame my dogs may have is the fact that they are the only ones of their kind in Hollywood, at least as far as I know. They come from Siberia, and they are known as Samoyeds. Hmm. Well, since names make news, Anna, what do you call them? Well, uh, one is Pushok, which means swan down. One is Druzhok, meaning little friend. And the third is Vanka, a nickname for Ivan. Hmm. Pushok, Druzhok, and Vanka. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a cinch they're not Irish, like my setter. But I thought you said you had a quartet. Yes, I have. <laughs> and here's where I fool you. The fourth one is named Hooligan. Ah, a harp in a Russian choir. <laughs> and I suppose, Jean, that uh, you call your Irish setter Ivan Ivanov. No, I call him Trey, after the dog immortalized in Stephen Foster's poem. <laughs> but tell me, Anna, how did you happen to name a Russian dog hooligan? Well, hooligan means roughneck in Russian, too. Oh. And my hooligan is about the loveliest dog I've ever seen. 
Always in a dither. Did you say lather? No, Uh-oh. I said um, dither. But if you're looking for a chance to get in a word about Lux Toilet Soap, Mr. DeMille... Well, I am. Well, I'll say a good word for it any time. Lux Toilet Soap has been the favorite in my household since ever I came to Hollywood. Thank you, Anna. You two will have to bring your dogs over sometime and get acquainted with my family. There's Darky DeMille, the Cocker Spaniel, Josephine DeMille, the St. Bernard, and Lutz von Allador DeMille, a dachshund that Adrian, the designer, presented to Mrs. DeMille with the observation that dachshund speaks louder than words. Oh, that's marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> right now, my particular pets are a herd of deer on my ranch. After 15 years, I've tamed them to come within 10 feet of the front porch. Ooh. Perhaps when you and Anna are here next, I'll be able to say that they bring me the morning paper. <laughs> well, by that time, we'll probably have a lot more puppies to talk about. And uh, let's hope it won't take another 15 years to turn those deer into newsboys. <laughs> <laughs> well, good night, Mr. DeMille, and my appreciation to you and the Lux Radio Theater. Good night, Mr. DeMille. Good night, Anna. Good night, Jean. Thank you, Miss Sten and Mr. Raymond. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your announcer, Melville Ruick. There's an important announcement coming from Mr. DeMille in a moment. In the meantime, may I say that our stars tonight were assisted by Moroni Olson as Baron Oberlitz, Winifred Harris as Countess, Frank Nelson as Hugo and Secretary, Lee Millar as Higgins, Leo McCabe as Captain Beloritz, Eddie Kane as Lieutenant, Lou Merrill as Waiter, David Kerman as Soldier, Ross Forrester as a footman, Margaret Brayton as cigarette girl, and Mary Lou Fisher as hat check girl. Mr. Raymond, Mr. Gleason, and Mr. Olson appeared through courtesy of RKO Studios. Mr. DeMille, Paramount, and Mr. Silver's 20th Century Fox, where he was in charge of music for the new Irving Berlin film, On the Avenue. And now, Mr. DeMille. Let's suppose that you have two rich relatives, an uncle and a grandfather both of whom remember you in their wills. From your uncle, you get a million dollars. But Grandpa, who detested your uncle, gives you six million, on the condition, however, that you spend every penny left by Uncle Ned within one year. This is the dire situation in which our hero finds himself next Monday night. And who better to face it than that man of iron will and steel nerves, that stalwart of the networks, Ladies and gentlemen, Jack Benny. (laughs) Our play is Brewster's Millions and brings us not only Jack Benny, but his leading lady of laughter, Mary Livingston. (laughs) Our sponsors... The makers of Lux Toilet Soap join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents, through the courtesy of the makers of Jell-O, Jack Benny and Mary Livingston in Brewster's Millions. And now, may I urge you, if you haven't done so already, send a contribution to the American Red Cross. The work of rehabilitation in the flood area has only begun. Now, as seldom before, they need our full support. Please send your donation to the local chapter of the American Red Cross. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This program, ladies and gentlemen, came to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, the beauty care used by nine out of ten screen stars, and yet so inexpensive that every girl can use it every day. A cordial invitation goes to you to listen in again next Monday night when Cecil B. DeMille brings us a production of that sparkling comedy, Brewster's Millions, starring Jack Benny and Mary Livingston. Assisting them will be another all-star supporting cast and the Lux Radio Theater Orchestra under the direction of Louis Silvers. Until then, we bid you all good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.